Wedgeside Podcast is a proud member of the Wedgeside Media Collective. Right now until the end of February, you can still get $5 off any of the shirts on the Wedgeside Media Collective store. So just go to wedgesidecollective.org and use promo code SHIRT5 to grab a shirt now. That pretty much drops from most of them down to fifteen dollars. Yeah, there's a there's like ten dollar price range, fifteen dollar price range. I think yeah, like twenty is the highest yeah. price range on that. Go get a I support the ALF or the Circle A or you know support political prisoner shirts. And all that money goes to help fund different things, including the collective and prisoner support. So we're not like getting anything from yeah, that money. Yeah, no one's getting paid from any of this. This is all all going to help. You know either the collective or other other social justice movements. So help us out. Help prisoners out. Be cool. Whichsidecollective.org. Remember, promo code SHIRT5. And while you're there, you can also pre-order the Vegan Vespa-inspired design. It's only $15 right now pre-order. We only need four more. That's four more. That's the time of this episode releases until they get printed they get printed you have until march 31st so get it done get her done you'll probably hear about it all next month if we don't This is episode 172. Yeah, we talked with Molly Frissinger from the Taco Cleanse. If you haven't heard of the Taco Cleanse, you're probably living under a rock, but that's okay. It's pretty fucking hysterical and awesome that they were able to, to create this amazing cleanse where all you eat is tacos for 30 days. And yes, they're 100% vegan tacos. So sit back and stay tuned for the Taco Cleanse. Hey, Jordan, what news and events do we have going on this week? On February 11th in the UK, over 100 hens were liberated. Woohoo! If you have any events, let me know. If you would like to do a listener shout out and help support the podcast in the process, just go to whichsidepodcast.com. Click on the little donate tab. You can record your own shout out, or have us record something, and you get some awesome swag at the same time. So that's which side podcast. Click on the donate tab. Scroll to shout out section. I'll make it more easy in the future. Yeah, hopefully there'll be a revamp coming soon, right? Yeah. For the slingshot this week. Whoop, whoop. 20, 23rd of February, 1963. After a mass of complaints, Indiana repeals its ban on sex toys. I would complain about that shit too. That's ridiculous. So, yeah. Good job for getting that repealed in 1963, Indiana. I like these little tidbits of history. I pulled them out of the Slingshot Personal Organizer. Go get one yourself. Help organize your shit. And get these little fun facts every day. You can get one at a local info shop or an online info shop like AK Press. I also love that in the back, besides having like, places for notes and stuff, there's just so much information. Um, you can find collectives all over the world. It's amazing. So go check them out. I just love this shit. They don't pay for any of this. I mean, there's even tips for dealing with the police in here. Right? Shit everyone needs to know. Keep it in your pocket. I sincerely hope you enjoy this episode. So uh, how, how's your day going so far? It's going great. So, uh, the weather here is beautiful. We have the air conditioning on. What the hell? <laughs> That's not fair. No. We had it snow today. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you're down in Austin, right? Yeah. So 
how how is Austin being vegan? Like um, everyone says, it's it's just like amazing. Mecca, yeah. yeah. It is. It's a fantastic place to be vegan. There's so much food and such great community. Um, just so many great restaurants that. So are you, are you from Austin or did you locate there? Uh, I grew up in uh, Dallas, Fort Worth area. So I've been here for about six years, I think. So did, um, I'd- did, did uh, Austin kind of like, drag you in because like, because of the veganism or were you just happened to be vegan and live in Austin? I, I just happened to be vegan and moved to Austin for uh, my husband lives here. So that was it. I actually, I went vegan in Baton Rouge. So Austin just seemed amazing after that. <laughs> yeah. What was bad about Baton Rouge? Nothing was bad. It's just, it was very hard to find any vegan food. There's just so much seafood at restaurants. Yeah. Did you learn how to make a, an amazing vegan gumbo? I did, actually. Um, I, there's a great recipe in Mark Bittman's How to Cook Everything Vegetarian. Uh-huh. And they just add a whole bunch of um, vegan sort of sausages and tempeh. It's really good. That sounds really good. I, I'm a huge fan of okra, so I just mm. love gumbo. <laughs> I've never figured out how to fry it, though, very well. Fry which part? Uh, fry okra. I, I know it's oh, not part oh, of. Oh, oh, fry yeah. okra. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Deep frying is scary. <laughs> yes. So, so what? What's your what's your origin story? What what brought you to veganism and and to where you are today? I actually started out as an environmentalist. Um, I'd read a lot of actually Michael Pollan. His book convinced me to go vegan, even though it's horrible about vegans. Um, But just it made me think about, you know, where my food was coming from and the impact it had on the world. Um, But since then, I'm very much into all of the aspects of it, um, animal rights and the health aspect as well. I'm not I'm not familiar with his book. What what book is that? The Omnivore's Dilemma. Oh, Oh, okay, okay, Sorry. I've heard of that one. Yeah. I never read it because I was already vegan. So, yeah, I didn't have a dilemma. There is a section there about vegans and it's just terrible. It's like he didn't even try to find a good way to go about it. So did you, when you were reading it, did you just kind of like blow over that portion and be like, well, everything else is good? Well, I've, I've known lots of vegans. Um, lots of my friends in college were vegans. So I knew that what he was representing wasn't really true. And mm-hmm. that it's not, you know, tofu dogs for every meal. <laughs> so what, what uh, gravitates you towards his book to begin with? Sorry. What what really gravitates you toward his his book? Because I mean, it sounds like you are probably pretty close already on that path. If if you know, uh, just you know, thinking about my part in the world and the environment has always been really important to me. Um, I was you know the nerdy kid in uh, middle school who was in the science club and the environmental club. Um, so it's just something I've spent a lot of time thinking about. And I moved to Baton Rouge just after college, and I didn't know anybody. And it just seemed like a really good time to make a big change like that. So you did the change all by yourself? Yeah. How hard? Was that like hard not having like a, a support structure behind it? Or did you kind of gravitate and find a support structure uh, in Louisiana? Um, I, had, I actually somehow ended up with a book club that was all Jewish and vegan. Um, I'm not sure how that happened. But so I did have some friends that were vegan. Um, but I spent a lot of time online. It was... I don't know, 2006, when there was just the PPK was really beginning to take off. Mm-hmm. And so did you get a lot of inspiration from Isisandra then? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I don't think I would have written a cookbook if I hadn't learned about vegan cooking from her. What was like the, uh, the idea behind actually sitting down and writing the taco cleanse? Uh, we just, it sort of just came about as something funny to do. We were sitting around and drinking margaritas and eating tacos. And someone said, you know, I've only eaten tacos today. And, you know, wouldn't it be funny if we only ate tacos for like three days? And someone else said, well, you know, let's just go all the way 30 days. You know, that's what a true cleanse is. And we just thought it was so fun to do. Um, We did it for Vegan Mofo in 2013. 
I mean, it's a fucking brilliant idea, by the way. So much kudos to you all. <laughs> Thanks. And, and I absolutely love how you guys piece together your website as well. I, I love your 2016 resolutions. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, how how hard is it to like have this idea and then actually make it come to fruition? Was it more of just like we're joking around to make this, and then like at what point did it become like a serious goal and like a serious task? Um, it became serious when the publisher contacted us and said, "So it originally started. We did it for Vegan Mofo. Thirty days, we all ate tacos at every meal." And afterwards, we did a zine as a fundraiser, um, and we sold maybe 100 copies of that. And one of those copies ended up in the hands of our publisher, and they contacted us and said, hey, do you want to make this a book? And we just thought that sounded so fun. Um, so it was just such a really, really fast process, though. They gave us about two months to write all of the recipes. Oh, wow. So uh, did you, like, have to test every recipe first, or did you just kind of throw something out there be like I think this will work we did test the recipes that's one of the benefits of four authors is that there was another person to make each recipe yeah and uh Jessica Morris she owns rabbit food groceries she was our guinea pig because she's actually not a cook so if she could follow the recipe anyone could do it <laughs> that's good because I, I I don't classify myself as a very good cook either <laughs> so w what was the the like giving such a tight deadline what, what was the hardest part about like meeting that? I, I think it's just what you would expect coming up with the recipes and tweaking them and testing them all in time. And then also, you know, getting four people together often enough to do the rest of the writing. So who are all, all the four authors for, for all the listeners? There's four of us. Um, I'm Molly Freisinger. And then there's uh, Jessica Morris, who I said owns Rabbit Food Grocery here in Austin. It's an all vegan grocery store. Uh, Stephanie Bogdanich and Wes Allison. And you said that it started out as a zine. Like, how much of uh, a difference from the the zine to the cookbook is there? So there were maybe thirty recipes in the book, and there's almost a hundred. Or sorry, thirty recipes in the zine, and there's almost a hundred in the book. Um, we used maybe two third of the recipes from the zine, and then there's also some other bits in there, like the interview to find out what kind of taco eater you are. Um, <laughs> But there is a huge amount of new material in the book. So you also run a blog, right? Uh, yes, though. It, it's been dormant for a little bit. Um, I run Lone Star Plate, which is uh, just all about veganism throughout Texas. There's sort of this idea that Texas is a place with, you know, cowboys and barbecue. But there's actually the state, even in some of the smaller areas. So I wanted to show that to the rest of the world. What what do you find um, being the hardest part about being vegan in Texas is? I mean, being in Austin, it must be just uh, a fucking breeze. But is it is it really as difficult outside of Austin or um, like because I just imagine it being super, super hard. But a lot of people imagine Utah being super hard, too. But it's fucking fantastic. Um, I, I mean, like any place else, if you're in a small town, um, if you're taking a road trip, it's going to be harder to find food. You're going to be eating at Chipotle, but Chipotle is not bad. Um, I guess it just depends where you are. Austin is just a really great place to be vegan. Um, so I just haven't had to put up as, with as much of the small town. Mm -hmm. So how did you come up with the recipes that are in the cookbook? A lot of them are inspired by our favorite restaurants here in Austin. There's a chipotle sauce, which is a lot like a chipotle sauce at uh, the Vegan Nam, which is a taco truck. And we just also ripped off of other things that we just like to eat. Um, trying to think of a good example. Uh, chili. I, I love chili. The, the chili in the Frito pie recipe is actually a chili that I made at the Texas Veggie Chili Cook-Off and won second place. So that's the same chili. Um, so we really just thought of what we like to eat. Had you ever tried that kind of variety of tacos before? Like some of the things you'd never think would work in a taco, but they sound really delicious. A lot of them. I mean, I mean, there's just really a sort of mishmash taco cuisine in Austin. So you can get, you know, Korean barbecue tacos and mac and cheese, uh, brisket tacos, uh, vegan ones, obviously. Um, so there's just a lot of that here. 
But we also really experimented when we spent a whole month eating nothing but tacos because, <laughs> you know, you don't want to eat the same three tacos over and over again. Yeah. Um, I, my first day doing the cleanse, one of my tacos was a soup taco where I made um, Allende Howell's uh, broccoli cheese soup. And I just made it, you know, extra thick so I can eat it in a tortilla. <laughs> Do you, do you ever just kind of be like, how the fuck did this work? Like, how did this get so big? It was really shocking when it blew up in January. I mean, we, we wanted people to find the book funny, but apparently if Jen Jennifer Aniston mentions your book in an interview, then everybody wants to try it. <laughs> Were they taking it seriously? A lot of people are taking it seriously. I get a couple emails every week asking me how many calories to eat, which is really sort of weird because <laughs> we're anti-diet, and I think that's really clear in the book, but I guess not everybody gets that. Do, do you answer those people, or do you kind of just let those go like go dormant? I, I try to give a jokey answer so that they get the idea that it's not serious, but sometimes I go through you know three or four emails, and I finally have to say, the book is a joke. I'm not a nutritionist. I'm not the person to answer this. <laughs> we have a really angry review on Amazon, a one-star review saying that, you know, this book is a joke and you should just stick to real diets. And I disagree. <laughs> that, that's like a one-star review you should be proud of, right? <laughs> yeah. All of our one-star reviews are great. There's another one that says, oh, no, this book is vegan. They hid it from me. And, of course, it's all over the cover and the yeah. description. <laughs> Well, you did it. Didn't do a very good job hiding it then. <laughs> uh, I, I, I love the, the, the humor aspect of it, though. I, I, I just I think that's what sells it for so many people, because, I mean, we get so tired of, of always having like veganism as equated as a diet or a fad or, you know, and this this kind of takes a little bit of, a, of a, a jab at that kind of mentality and looking at what veganism really is. Yeah, we really wanted it to be fun. There's a lot of, you know, shoulds in veganism that you should eat, you know, healthy or no oil or gluten-free. And we just wanted to show that it's fun and we have a sense of humor. Do you do you follow any of those other, you know, shoulds or, or notions about veganism? Do, do any of those stereotypes match who, who you are, if I can ask? I don't think so. Um I, I really can't think of any. I, I've eaten sort of lowish carb before, but that's because I have type one diabetes, which has nothing to do with being vegan. Um, I really, I, I just do not embrace diets at all. I think you know, you should definitely eat healthy and treat your body kindly. But I think diets are so much about hating yourself and hating your body. They're not about nourishing yourself. Mm -hmm. Um, you you mentioned that you have you have type one diabetes. Just for anyone who doesn't know, that's like the early onset diabetes, right? Yes, I've had it since I was three. So how, how has um, veganism like, affected people's uh, perception of you, of you and having type 1 diabetes? Um, I think people are surprised because they do think of diabetes as something where you have to eat extremely low carb, which really isn't true. Um, you know, veganism hasn't really affected my diabetes one way or another. I'm not healthier. I'm not less healthy. Mm -hmm. It's just another part of my life. Mm -hmm. Do you, do you find people uh, make like the assumption when they don't really like know your history that you know you're you're vegan just for the health reasons because of the diabetes? Um. Yeah. I, definitely, people make that assumption sometimes. Um, I get asked a lot if I'm gluten free which for some reason everybody is doing these days. Um, but I think I'm also just very, very open about my veganism. Um, I'm actually one of the founders of Texas Veg Fest here, so I am very vocal about the animal aspects of veganism. How, we, how hard is putting together a Veg Fest? Because I know Jordan is putting one right here now for Salt Lake City. Mm -hmm. um, so hopefully we'll have one soon. Yeah, It's incredibly hard. It takes about nine months of work to pull one off, um, at least the way that we want to do it. Um, the first year we did a festival, we probably called two or 3,000 people or emailed that many people. Um, so it's a lot of work, but it's really worth it to see so many people sort of experiencing vegan food and the ideas that, you know, animals don't deserve to be treated, you know, stuck in cages and treated badly. So it, it's really rewarding, even though it's a ton of work. 
what what's the the biggest what's the biggest challenge for you um putting together a veg fest um really just finding the time um i was you know had a full we all had full-time jobs when we started it so i spent my lunch hour sitting in my car calling companies for you know four or five months in a row so i uh, really just getting that time together because you know, it's a business of a sort and businesses have to run during business hours. So mm-hmm. I had to be available. Do you, is it something you recommend people to do if they don't have one in their area or is it kind of like, maybe not? It's a fuck ton of work. You should do it, but if you really, you cannot underestimate how much work this or cannot overestimate how much work it is. Um, so think of how much work it's going to be and then triple that. But I really do think it's worth it. And you can obviously start on a much smaller scale than we did. I think we had 1,500 people our first year um, and 75 booths. So you can definitely start at a smaller level. A lot of places just start in a community center or a church or something like that. So um, if you're not willing to put in you know, hundreds of hours, a smaller place is a great place to start. How many people were in the core of that group? It started with, I want to say about eight people as the main volunteers, but it sort of whittled down over time. Um, a lot of the people who helped organize the first one also had other things going on. Jessica and Gabriel Figueroa um, were opening Rabbit Food Grocery at the same time. Kristen Davaport was opening Capital City Bakery. So it's just, there were a lot of people getting pulled in a lot of directions. Um, so the second year, it was just four of us organizing it. Did that, that create more challenges or did it kind of streamline it for you a little bit? It was easier in a lot of ways um, because there were fewer people that had to agree to something, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um, it's hard to get a consensus when you're dealing with, you know, eight or 12 people. Um, but it's also, you know, you really have to be able to delegate because there's really is too much for one person to do alone. Totally. Um, kicking it back to... to uh, your, your origin a little bit. How, how did your um, friends and family take you changing to becoming vegan? Um, I don't think my mother has adjusted it to it yet. And it's been more than 10 years. Um, <laughs> I still get asked at Thanksgiving every year if Cool Whip is vegan. Um, <laughs> I mean, to be fair, there think, was Hip Whip. It's close. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I think everybody else's has adjusted pretty well. I've always been sort of a, a light meat eater before I was vegan. So I had friends visit me actually the first year that I went vegan and didn't even notice they were there an entire week and didn't notice that I hadn't eaten any meat. Um, so I think I just have a great group of friends and family for the most part. What, what does your mom find challenging about um, accepting it? I honestly don't know. I know she just is resistant to reading labels. I think it just doesn't occur to her to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. I think she really likes to show her love through food, and she doesn't know how to cook vegan food, so that just creates conflict for her. Just have her read the taco cleanse. That's what I'm saying, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> how was she about the, the, the cookbook when it came out? Was, was she like supportive of it or kind of like, oh, okay. She is super excited. She's probably bought 50 copies. Um, <laughs> she's giving them to everybody she knows. I mean, so that, I mean, that's pretty supportive, right? Yeah. 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 I mean, you could have like way worse, I guess. <laughs> um, my, my mom, after about, about around the 10 year mark, she finally was like, I guess this isn't a fad, is it? <laughs> so, yeah, it can take a long time. Yeah, and I think my brother had a college roommate who was vegan, and he unfortunately ate a horrible diet, which did not include any B12, and he had serious health issues. So I think that probably affected my mom's idea as well, um, since he was so sick. So everybody take your B12. Yeah. So I first heard about Taco Cleanse on the news. Um, What was it like being on the news? I think that they thought it was a serious thing. They even brought a dietitian on, if I'm remembering right. I know the one you're talking about. Yeah, it's really weird how many people didn't get that it's a joke. Um, it was sort of like a giant game of telephone where one person post, uh, wrote about it and then several other people stole their story and changed it slightly until it got just completely 
was not at all accurate. There were things saying that there were three of us or that um, we all lost weight, which is not true. Or <laughs> It was just, it got changed and garbled so much. I, I really made me realize that I just can't trust what I read in the media. <laughs> Did did you try to fight it at, at all, like the, the misinformation, or you just kind of roll with it? Uh, we tried to point people out. I think there was one article, they had Marion Nestle, who's, you know, sort of a big deal nutritionist, and they asked her about it as if it were a real thing. And so I tweeted at her and said, you know, if anybody else asks you, this is a joke. Um, but really, there were just so many people writing about it, there wasn't any way to fight it. How did she respond to that? She didn't respond at all. I'm a little sad. <laughs> Did she respond to the other people about it? No, I sort of not very many people called it out on the article, which is just so weird. It's hard to look at this and not see that it's a joke. Um, and it makes me worry about people that they can't see that. <laughs> that is just in, like, crazy to me. What 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 has been like the most shocking thing about the the whole experience for you? I mean, it probably is that, that people don't get it to joke. I think they hear vegan and they assume, you know, diet and actual cleanse. And, you know, this isn't that kind of cleanse. We like to say it's a cleanse for your soul. Um, but, yeah, you're not going to lose 50 pounds. Your skin isn't going to glow. But we hope you'll be happier. <laughs> so, I just I can't can't get over the fact that like, how many people really took it took it so seriously. Um, what kind of comments like for people saying? I think for the most part, people got the joke and loved it, but there were lots of, like I said, I still get people asking me, you know, how much weight did we lose? How many tacos should I eat at every meal? And I say, you know, as many until you're full. Um, I, I think, you know, it, it's been a great response overall. Is Do you guys have any plans to uh, continue this on down the road? Or are you going to, move it into other realms or pizza's really good. We we're actually thinking about gluten maybe where you have gluten at every meal. <laughs> <laughs> that that's fantastic. You call it the free gluten cleanse. Yeah. You looked at me like I don't get it. I'm sorry. I don't know. Free gluten, gluten free. I don't know. Oh. <laughs> We were fun. trying to come up with ideas for a title, but so many of them were actually taken by real books. Oh, um, really? <laughs> yeah. Like, what what kind of names are you guys batting around? Oh, I can't even remember at this point. I know Gluten Freedom was one of them, um, <laughs> and that's a real book. Um, <laughs> Gluten Freedom? Like, I can't even remember at this point. We came up with probably 100 different ideas. Are they all gluten-free books? Oh, sorry. A hundred different title ideas. Are, are they all? Are all the books that were taken gluten free? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> what, what's What's crazy to me is that like people must like just hear the word vegan and automatically kind of equate it with being a little crazy. So they automatically assume that you know a taco cleanse, which sounds a little crazy, is not beyond the realm of what a, a, a crazy vegan would be. Yeah. I kind of like embracing that. I like the idea of embracing that kind of a little craziness a little bit. Yeah, it's really fun. Like I said, we've enjoyed all of our one-star reviews because just every single one of them, they really don't get the joke. And so it's sort of turned around on them. Has anyone actually written about trying the 30-day cleanse? Yeah, we've had a lot of people... A lot of people have done the one week, so there's four levels. You can do it for a day, three days, a week, or a month. And a lot of people have done the one week. Um, there's definitely somebody on Instagram right now who's posting about every meal he eats for a month. It's going to be tacos. And that guy actually isn't even vegan, so he's really you know, jumped into this. So we nice. like to see that. Have you heard of any converts to veganism uh, that attribute your work to it at all? I don't know if anyone's gone fully vegan, but we've had a lot of people say, you know, we didn't realize that tacos could be vegan and that they're going to be cooking a lot of them. So that's always good to hear. Huh. So for you personally, what what is um, the hardest part about veganism for you? You've been vegan for over 10 years, so 
um, it really at that point, not too many challenges, but like maybe when you were going vegan, like what was the hardest thing for you? Like when you were going vegan? It was definitely eating out um, in Baton Rouge. There were just, there's not a vegetarian restaurant. Well, at the time there wasn't a vegetarian restaurant in all of Louisiana. Um, I think the closest ones were actually in Austin. Um, so I think a lot of it eating out was a problem, but I also didn't have enough money to eat out since I was working at a nonprofit. So that sort of worked out. <laughs> yeah. That makes it a little easier, right? Yeah. Um, what, what kind of, like, what's been the biggest change that you've noticed over the decade of you being vegan, um, both positive and negative towards either veganism or the animal rights movement or environmentalism in general? I think there's a lot more accessible vegan food. A lot of people have heard of vegan food um, and there's more options. You know, there's so many different kinds of plant-based milk at the grocery store. Um, so that's really great. I, my grandmother took me to her country club and they had a vegan item on the menu. So it's just, you know, everywhere now, which is great. Um, on the other hand, I do think there's a lot of people who keep constricting veganism so that you can't have oil or you can't have, you know, processed foods, whatever that means to them. And I think it really just kind of, it makes it hard for people to really embrace veganism. One of the things um, I like to talk about is what is something in the the uh, animal rights movement or scene that you would like to see happen that isn't necessarily happening uh, very much or at all right now? Um, I definitely would say more intersection uh, intersectionality. I'd like to see working with groups that are beyond, you know, just the animal rights group. I think we're very, a very white group, definitely. And so I think it's important to reach out to people who aren't quite like us. Like when when you say intersectionality, do you meaning just like um, incorporating like like Black Lives Matter? Or are you talking about more uh, incorporating environmentalism? Or are you talking about like just all of it in the broad spectrum? All of it, uh, feminism, um, yeah, all of it. To to you, what kind of personally speaks to you in that intersectionality? Um, I think that animal rights are part of a greater a greater thing and that, you know, we should be treating everybody. I'm not going to say this very well because it's such a big topic. Um, oh, you're fine. I just like, think that, you know, being a good person, you have to be a good person in all matters of your life and not in just one narrow way. Yeah. I mean, I think that's one of the struggles I have in, in conveying, con conveying that to, to others, right? Like um, if you're involved in, in, in other movements in any way, it's conveying how, veganism relates to just the, the greater, greater struggle of general equality, right? Um, and, mm -hmm. and viewing things um, um, more of an, um, a less of a hierarchical way, I should say, you know. Yeah, definitely. I obviously need to work on my elevator pitch for that. Me, me too. Do you have any, like, <laughs> like, <laughs> do you have any hints or tricks? Because it, it's such a hard... I feel like, um, especially as a straight white male, I feel like it's an uncomfortable situation to have to be like, we need to talk to more than straight white males, you know, or, mm -hmm. you know, kind of an an idea. Um, and I also like find it hard, like you, you don't want to come in and have the, the white knight mentality either mm -hmm. towards everything. Yeah. Um, just sort of in a very small practical way. Uh, in planning the Texas Veg Fest, we always make a huge effort to get a variety of people in um, as speakers and to have, you know, people of color and lots of women um, and actually lots of men because a lot of veganism is a very female group in a lot of ways. Um, and so just reaching out to people, going an extra step to um, find people who don't look like you and who don't speak like you. You know, like you just mentioned, like um, veganism is a, is a very large female group. One of the things I struggle with is that you, like all the statistics is that it is a majority uh, female driven. But if you look at the quote unquote leaders in the animal rights movement, they're by and far largely white males. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that's a huge struggle as a movement we need to be focused on as well. Um, I agree. And I think there's also the dichotomy that the sort of 
I don't know for a better word, but the sort of activists and philosophers tend to be men Mm -hmm. and the Mm -hmm. cookbook authors are all women. And so that is sort of a women in the kitchen kind of thing going on. You know, I never even thought about that. Like like that, that I'm actually kind of ashamed that I haven't even thought about that. Um, did you guys approach that when you were writing your book at all? Like, like have discussions surrounded about that? I don't think we talked about that too much. We definitely talked a lot about dieting culture, Mm -hmm. um, which I think is, you know, it's anti-woman. Um, but no, I don't think we'd really talked about that. You know, it, Speaking about like the dieting culture and especially being vegan, it's one of the the fears I have um, raising my daughter because, you know, obviously I'm raising her vegan. So she's, you know, very aware of everything. But I also want to make sure that she never has uh, body type issues surrounded by that because she's already getting, you know, oh, you're skinny because you're vegan kind of comments and things like that. Um, I don't know how to to combat it or fix it. It's just a, a concern, right? It's so hard because it's just ingrained into all of us that, you know, even if you're very body positive, there's still this, you know, ingrained idea that we are what our bodies look like. Mm -hmm. Um, And actually, my son is a year and a half, and I've already had a family member tell me that they're concerned that he's overweight, which just flabbergasted me because that's not even possible. So it starts so early. Um, with, with your son, have you ever had any, um, like concerns from like pediatricians or anything? No, my pediatrician doesn't care. Um, I mean, not that she doesn't care, but she's not concerned about it. Um, and also sort of, I have type one diabetes and it also runs on my husband's side of the family. Mm -hmm. And one of the possible causes is cow's milk. So we also have that sort of going as an accessible reason for our family to get why we're feeding him a certain way. You know, it makes me so relieved to hear that about your, your your pediatrician. I've like we've never experienced it either um, with with any of our daughter's pediatricians. And they, it seems to be a non issue, but it's been always a huge fear of ours, right? Like if we ever have to go to a different pediatrician or move, or that's always like been a fear. But so far, luckily, I mean, I should knock on wood, right? It's never been an issue. So I'm hoping we've kind of gotten over that hump, or maybe I'm just lucky. I don't know. I was worried about it too, but just nobody's blinked an eye. My um, obstetrician didn't care when I was pregnant either. She said, as long as you eat more than French fries and pasta, it's fine by me. Um, (laughs) I think when my wife was pregnant, the only thing um, her OB said, or no, maybe it was the pediatrician was like, oh, when you switch over, just make sure to give them full fat soy milk. Like, (laughs) don't worry about it. It's good for them. Kind of an idea, right? Yeah. I don't know. The whole the whole thing is, is crazy to me. Um, one of the things that, that is really hard now is uh, we are looking at, at adoption um, and, and moving forward in, in those type of realms. And one of the concerning things for me is like, to the best of my knowledge, there's no like vegan formulas currently on the market. They all um, are very, some of them are close, but some of them will contain D3. It's, it's just, I, I hate knowing those type of things. Yeah, we actually fed my son formula a little bit. Um, and it's just, you know, that's what's available. And so you yeah. do your best. I mean, you have to, right? I mean, it's not like yeah. you, you wouldn't. It's just, um, I, my wife was telling me that there is um, a new company that is going to be coming to market with a new vegan formula. They're working through packaging right now. So hopefully that will, will come through soon if that's a reality. I don't know. I don't know if that's true or not. So That would be nice. What what has been the biggest challenge so far for you being um, a vegan parent? I have to say it's actually not been hard. Um, my son's school is pescatarian, so, you know, and they're fine with the no milk thing. So it's, it actually hasn't been hard at all. And there's a great vegan community here with, um, with the, there's actually a Austin vegan families group that gets together for potlucks. Um, so I'm very lucky to live where I live. That's amazing to have um that kind of community resource together because, I mean, we would love something like that. Unfortunately, we don't have that here. Yeah, we were um we were actually in the talks of working out a, a vegan parenting podcast at one point for the collective, mm-hmm. but um, I'm not sure where that's that's gone. Yeah, we. That would be great. I would listen. 
<laughs> <laughs> yeah, we were we were working with um Gen Gen, Gen Veg Generation Veg, um <laughs> yeah on that yeah so so hopefully it's something will that will actually work through, um eventually. I th I think it'd be amazing because I mean we still run into it. What's really hard now about my daughter is that we didn't experience when she was younger. She's almost ten now. Um, is that now she's like experiencing things where you know she feels, um. Like if we, she goes to a birthday party, we'd always like get her a vegan cupcake or something like that, which was always fine until now. She's like, now I have the nicest cupcake and I feel bad that my cupcake looks so much better than all of their stuff. Right. <laughs> so it's like the opposite problem. <laughs> How funny. Because, you know, you go buy a vegan cupcake at a vegan bakery. They usually look a little bit nicer than, you know, someone's homemade cake for their eight year old's birthday party. Right. <laughs> <laughs> So it's a it's a little bit different of a problem, but um, it, it's been amazing is watching her talk about it with other kids with when they don't know adults are listening. Um, mm -hmm. it, the the conversations are just like mind boggling, it, like just cute and like insightful. So I mean, it's totally amazing, and you know, hopefully you'll experience the same thing. I hope so. It, with 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 your publisher, are they pushing you to to do another book, or they already offered you guys a, another deal? Is that why you've been putting it on the table, or is it something you'd actually have to go and pitch at this point? We'll have to go and pitch it. Um, there is a clause in our contract that we have to give them first right of refusal on anything that we do. Um, but we really, we just, you know, it's been so much fun. We want to do it again. How? I mean, if you haven't pitched yet, you probably don't know. I was just going to say, how, do, how does one actually go about pitching to a publisher? Like, what do you, like, what are the steps you have to do to get ready for that, um, for that meeting to happen? Um, so you want to have a sample table of contents, a description of what the book will be like and who would be interested in buying it. Um, if you can have some information about what market is out there. Um, for instance, I've got statistics on how many people eat a gluten-free or a low-gluten diet. Um, so I, I think that really helps. Some people go through an agent. I don't know anything about that. It just seems like, it seems super daunting to me to try to go through one of those processes. Um, but I guess it's just one of those, kind of those process where you're just like, well, I'm going to do it and go head on kind of into the dark, right? Yeah. Um, a little different for me. I actually, until about two months ago, worked in publishing, um, though it was academic publishing, which is a very different thing. Um, mm. But I feel very comfortable with, you know, the process of how it goes. What can I ask? What what you did in academic publishing? Yeah, I was a manuscript editor, which is sort of a cross between a copy editor and a project manager. Um, and I worked at the University of Texas Press, and we did a lot of, you know, art books and. Um, books on uh, Latin American studies and Latina studies, uh, gender studies, film, art. That must have, like, that must be amazing. Like the, the like what would be coming across your desk. Um, it w did, I would just be amazed to like, feel like I was constantly always learning. It, it is. It's, you learn some really interesting things. However, you don't really have time to read all the books you work on. Yeah. Um, someone else is doing the, the line editing where they read every line. Mm -hmm. um, so like I said, it's a lot of it is project managing. So you're just reading like certain portions of a book? Yeah, you, you go through and sort of like you're formatting the book to make it easier for the designer to create the book. Making sure um, like you hit timelines. So yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to um, cut you off. <laughs> Yeah, so you're reading bits and pieces here and there, and sometimes some books are more engrossing than others, and you really get pulled in. Um, so basically what you're telling me is that you have a way better grasp of the English language than I do. <laughs> Possibly, yeah. <laughs> you don't need to be modest. No, it's, def it's definitely so. Trust me on that one. <laughs> so what, what can I do to increase my grasp of this language that I know very little about? Read. <laughs> but that's so hard. <laughs> what what kind of um what kind of reading do you like to do? Like what kind of books really grasp your your, your attention? Uh, I like to read a lot of things. Um I like to read um oh 
This is so hard to answer because I read so many different things. Um, I actually really like to read about nutrition, which is funny since I'm anti-diet, um, but I find it fascinating. Um, I like to read about animal rights. I like uh, lots of fiction. I'm currently reading mysteries. Um, a little bit of everything. What what inspires you? Like, what kind of books inspire you, or do you have like a favorite favorite inspiring book that that either brought you closer to uh, animal rights, closer to you know, just your own personal set of beliefs? Oh, that's a hard one. Um, I think the books that honestly speak more to me are fiction rather than nonfiction, but I just like learning from the nonfiction, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. But I don't know if any one animal rights book has really spoken to me since, you know, I, I, I don't know. One of the ones that, that has really surprised me lately is um, I'm reading The Magic of Reality with my daughter uh, mm-hmm. by, by Richard Dawkins. And it, for some reason, like it just for me, like I, I it goes into a lot of like um, evolutionary biology and, you know, origins of species kind of like, but in a very simplified manner. It's almost like a, an explain like I'm 10 manner. I almost want to say five, but it's not quite that that level. And I feel like it, it's re- just really helped me understand so much more um, contextually uh, how small we are as people. And it's made me feel super insignificant and awesome at the same time. <laughs> is there a lot of freedom in being insignificant? I feel like there is, personally. Yeah, there could be. Yeah. I had that total moment at work the other day where I pulled up. We live right next to like, these majestic mountains. I pulled up to my work and I'm looking at these majestic mountains and I'm like, these will be here in 10,000 years and I won't. My life doesn't matter. Fuck this. Why am I at work? Like, <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I don't know. Do, do you ever, do you have that feeling of, of insignificance or, or is that really just uh, a trait in myself? Uh, definitely. I think, I think of it more in time and how short our lifespan is in comparison to everything in the universe. Um, but yeah, I mean, we're, we're here for a short time. We have a small amount that we can affect, but it feels good to work on it. You know, thinking about like the, the short amount of time we are here, it personally makes me want to be more engaged and more involved in community and making things better for, for the now because we only have the now. You know what I mean? Yeah. So definitely definitely not a nihilist in that aspect. <laughs> well, how, how can people um, get a hold of your work, maybe go to your blog, get a, get a hold of the book? and follow what you guys are doing. Uh, definitely the Taco Cleanse blog is the one to go to now, uh, tacocleanse.com. You can get the book at wherever else you would usually buy books, um, obviously Amazon, but I encourage you to go to your local bookseller um, and all of those you know, book people and Powell's have it. Um, and then we're on all the social media, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and can you name your top five tacos that you recommend? Ooh, five. Um, my favorite is the Migas taco, which is sort of it's a tofu scramble with uh, jalapenos, onions, and tomatoes, and tortilla chips. Um, I also really like the mac and cheese and, and barbecue brisket taco. Um, oh, five. <laughs> uh, I like just I like the just basic breakfast taco, tofu scramble, and tempeh bacon. Um, I think I like a lot of the the basic ones, refried beans and potatoes, one that I eat a lot. So what's your least oh, favorite? Oh, and obviously, obviously the ice cream taco. Oh. Yeah. So if those are your favorite, what's your least favorite in the book? Oh, that's such a mean question. Because um, <laughs> that's the first one I'm going to try to say bullshit. <laughs> I honestly, I can't think of... I mean, I liked everything that I tried. Um, obviously, I'm not going to make put a, a recipe in a cookbook if I don't like it. Totally. But there has to be one that you're like, well, I just don't ever make that one. It's good, but... <laughs> uh, maybe I would say the... Um, oh, what is the title of it? It's got 
coconut in it, young coconut, and that's a lot of work to, to cut into a young coconut. Um, what is it called? Tropical ceviche. But it's actually, it's delicious, and if you can get someone else to make it for you, you should eat it. <laughs> I, I will definitely do that. I will get someone to make it for me. That person will be Jordan. <laughs> um, well, well, thank you so much for, for being on tonight and taking the time. We end every episode saying, fuck, shit, damn. Would you mind saying it for us this week? Okay, my mom's not listening, so fuck, shit, damn. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, right. Have a wonderful Have a night. night. This week you heard Charm and Counter Charm by Shit and Shine. Right now you're listening to Second Guessing by Tussle. iTunes, please consider going writing a, a review and rating us. If you don't know what to write, tell us a joke. Tell us a story. Tell us about the most fucked up excuse you've heard about not being vegan. Just do whatever you want in the review, honestly. Just go take the time, help out the show. It just makes us more visible so we can reach more listeners makes it easier to find the show on the searches and after you do that you should become our friend on social media we post things on there every day that we don't talk about on the show so be our friend like us follow us write to us tell us like the worst thing someone said to you that day and I'll I'll say you know what you can tell them this what was the worst thing that was said to you today I don't know my dad kind of pissed me off today a bit yeah political stuff yeah yeah that's what dads do right yeah yeah well fuck man shit damn it Which Side Podcast is hosted and produced by Jordan Halliday and Jeremy Parkin of the Which Side Media Collective, with web design by Jordan Halliday and sound design by Jeremy Parkin. Booking by Mari Halliday. Theme music by Commandantes. Go to wishsidecollective.org to check out the other shows in the collective. As always, fuck shit damn. <laughs>